Well, when I first came to work here, something very strange happened to me. I got psychologically mixed up. You don't say? Yes. I found myself falling for you. I can't believe it. Yes, Mr. Crawley, and very much so. Oh, in those first few weeks, there were moments in the stockroom when you could have swept me off my feet. Now I'm getting psychologically mixed up. Welcome to Season 5 of How Would Lubitsch Do It, a podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. It's 1940, and Whit Stillman and Jose Arroyo join us to discuss the shop around the corner. Come visit ernstcast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, a link to our Discord, or just to say hi. Hello, everyone. We're here with Whit Stillman. Hi, Whit. Thank you so much for dropping by. Thanks for having me. This has been a very international show. Are you beaming in from Paris right now? Yes, that's correct. I think it's fitting that we finally have a Lubitsch podcast that is at least partially recorded in Paris. If only one of us was in Budapest. But shop around the corner, when I approached you with the idea of recording an episode for this you know, little podcast, you immediately went to shop around the corner. And what I'd like to ask you is, I mean, I think it being an acknowledged masterpiece, it probably speaks for itself. But what about the film sticks out to you in his filmography? What speaks to you? Well, what I really care about in cinema is the sort of humanization of the characters, the opposite of dehumanization. And I also love comedy. And I think Shop Around the Corner is one of the most remarkable feats of humanizing comedy where each character has their soul and it's sort of a comic soul or a soul that's manifesting itself comically. I just rewatched the film last night and I've decided that Felix Bressart is the key actor in the movie, Pirovich. But there's so many really delightfully humorous characters. We can get right into Felix Bressart because in my notes for the film here, I wrote Pirovich is my hero. And yeah. Felix Broussard, we first saw in our Ninochka episode, yeah, he is maybe my favorite actor in any Lubitsch movie. He is incredible. What about Pirovich speaks to you? Uh, what about Felix Broussard's portrayal of him? It's so delicate and warm and charming and humorous. And of course, the scriptwriters are giving him just great material. <laughs> the great gag they have whenever Mr. Matochek says, I want your honest opinion. <laughs> And he goes to hide because there's no way you can win with Mr. Matichek <laughs> giving your honest opinion. And uh, he wants to keep his job to support his little family that he's so worried about. The thing about Felix Broussard is that I think he, he seems to me like the closest any actor has ever gotten to being Lubitsch on screen. Yeah. In this film, he seems to embody the things that Lubitsch values, this kind of good humored approach to life. They do sort of come from the same place. I mean, they're from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess it's a little bit like Laurel and Hardy. One is round and the other is a string bean. Yes, you, you sort of feel that you're getting the middle of Europa full dose from Felix Brassat. He even gets the greatest dunking joke in any Lubitsch film. And he gets the immortal line. Chronic, she's dunking. <laughs> Which I just love. I also think it's important that Felix Broussard is Jewish himself. And moreover, his characters tend to be coded Jewish. I think that this could be a good opportunity to kind of uh, draw parallels between him and other characters. Because in this film, the Broussard character, Pirovich, is simultaneously someone who clearly enjoys life and has this very go where the wind blows attitude towards life. He just doesn't seem ambitious. He doesn't ever try and take anyone down. But at the same time, he's palpably cheap. <laughs> and uh, essentially cares about getting back at his in-laws and has this very small time focus on his family that creates a character that, you know, on paper is not necessarily the most sympathetic person, but as played is you just love him to bits. And that kind of applies to everyone where everyone is so full of contradictions in this movie and lovingly so. I just noticed that he was sort of an Atlas figure carrying the weight of the responsibility mm. for his family. And yes. very, very concerned about keeping his job and making his living in order to support his family and to be able to continue. And so it's not being cheap, it's being responsible. And so he only wants people to come, you know, if they're good friends, they come after dinner. 
he seems to me all sweetness, but this huge responsibility he feels towards his family. And that scene where Jimmy Stewart's eyes and ears looking into the cafe at his correspondent, his dear friend, and interpreting it, describing things and advising him, it is so charming. It's a certain observational love triangle between the three of them. And when he sort of explains that Clara Novak really is, you have to say that, you know, Miss Novak is actually, you know, quite an attractive woman and all this kind of stuff and trying to bring Jimmy Stewart around to what he's going to be discovering. He's this conflict averse in the sense that he's always trying to repair bridges. He's the one who tries to reconcile Mr. Modercheck with Kralik. Yeah, he's very responsible. I mean, I think one of the great things about the movie too, is there's so many honorable characters. So the Jimmy Stewart, Alfred Credit character is really honorable. And for instance, when he goes to dinner at the Matterchecks and the next morning, he's very polite and careful about what he says and how, you know, delightful it was. And he has terrible indigestion, but he says it's the goose liver. And then when Vadas tries to say, oh, you didn't like the goose liver or something, he said, Wasn't it any good? Now look here, Vadas. Now, just a minute, folks, come over. Did you hear what he said? Could just, I want you to hear that. Did I make any derogatory remark about the goose liver? No, 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 no. I merely said that I had too much goose liver. A little That's too much. That's right. Right. The goose liver is fine. I just had too much of it. So he's not going to criticize anything about the dinner at the Matter Shacks. He's not going to say anything that can be interpreted negatively. And he's very loyal in the right way. Mm-hmm. He's not a yes man. And Felix Brassard is sort of the same. And and I think Clara Novak also is an idealist. The Jimmy Stewart character is interesting. And I, I can't help but think that Stewart is incredibly well cast because for all that, I mean, especially in this period, he was often playing that these upstanding roles. There's this hint of darkness behind him at all times. And I love that about this character where... He is simultaneously someone who aspires to be a man of letters, but is also just a little bit base. He has these flashes of insecurity and anger. You know, I I, I love the scene when Mr. Vardash, you could finally get his revenge against him for almost ruining his life. And Mr. Modercheck tells Kralik, do it quietly. Just don't make a scandal. And of course, he makes a huge scandal out of it and yells at him. And just a wonderful scene of revenge. I mean, I think it's part of the joke that Modercheck wants everyone to be discreet and say nothing and everyone immediately does all the opposite. That's just human nature. I love the ending. The last 20, 30 minutes of this film, I think is one of the greatest extended sequences in cinema. A large part of that for me is that last 10 minutes where Kralik and Clara are closing up. He's turning off all the lights and the entire dramatic irony of the relationship is being resolved. But his way of resolving it is not to come up with it. His way of resolving it is to tear down this idealized, imagined man of her dreams that she's been corresponding with He's now Alfred Popkin. He's he's a little pudgy in the stomach and he's just lost a job. This feels to be like it's simultaneously about his insecurities. The only way he can come up with it is by not having to measure up to this idealized man. But it's also, I mean, it's such an adorable sequence when you can see him just slightly torturing her with slow revelations about this man who doesn't exist until he obviously resolves it and it ends happily. He's just uh, very kindly and helpfully lowering her expectations so she'll be able to accept him. He's been brought brutally to reality and had to adjust. And I think he's trying to bring her slowly into the orbit of reality that he's the guy, he's the Mm -hmm. dear friend. And so it's very helpful for her to readjust to the romantic reality. I, I really think it's sort of divinely ordered, this universe, and God makes no mistakes. Is God is good and not evil. I mean, I guess it does take a little time and you can say, oh, he's holding back information from her and blah. But I think it's because there has to be this readjustment for things to work out. But one of the things about the casting in this period that I love so much is I'm not sure how you feel about Margaret Sullivan. Is she someone you like in a lot of movies? I generally like her. I think in this case, the meta text of her and Jimmy Stewart's past really deepens it for me. She and Jimmy Stewart were very close friends, and he had this unrequited crush on her for many years. And, and so in the two films when they're together, this and The Mortal Storm that I've seen, there's this real tenderness to the way that they approach each other that I find incredibly beguiling. I think she's perfect for this role. As an actress, I think she's very, very good. But in this, her way of etching out her characters, she's almost like this, you know, she's like this mouse, right? She's simultaneously timid, but can also bite Jimmy. That helps with the dynamic. What are your feelings on her? She's one of the three actresses I most admire and and, and love. And, And it's part of the casting miracle of the 30s of the studio period where they had Irene Dunn, Margaret Sullivan, Barbara Stanwyck, Betty Davis, 
all these women who are fascinating and wonderful. Then in the 50s, you sort of get people being hired for looks, the generation of sort of Gregory Peck and many women actresses who were very, very good looking, very pretty, but they didn't have the quality of the 30s actresses who Margaret Sullivan doesn't look like a fashion model. She has an incredibly charming voice and manner, really sort of ethereal and lovely. And I think it was more significant, actually, the relationship between James Stewart and Margaret Sullivan. I think it was kind of true, Jules and Jim, love triangle with Henry Fonda and James Stewart being friends and then being with Margaret Sullivan in the same theater company. I think it was the Provincetown Playhouse. And Henry Fonda marrying her, I think, Two of James Stewart's best friends married Margaret Sullivan. And Margaret Sullivan, he loved her and she loved him. She, I think, felt that she would sort of destroy him if they married, that she was harder than he was and more difficult. And she didn't want to harm him by marrying him. But I think they were arguably the two people who were most in love with each other. And I think maybe because he didn't marry her, he could preserve that regard for her his whole life, even though he married and had an absolutely wonderful marriage. He married quite late, but had a wonderful marriage. So I think, yeah, there's something beautiful feeling um, behind that. Uh, I don't think there has to be for a movie to work well, but it's there. Every single character in this film does not have the aura of that glamorous movie star. I don't think there's a single one. And the closest anyone comes is probably Vardish, who tries really hard to be glamorous, and he doesn't succeed. (laughs) He's great in being so oily and duplicitous and hateable, while also being sort of entertaining to watch and not occupying dead space. Excellent, delightful villain. It's a little bit cliched villain, but not too much. I guess you sometimes want this sort of two-dimensional character to be the bad guy. I was sort of proud in all our films that we avoided generally easily detestable villains. But then I remembered Rick von Sloniker and Metropolitan, which is probably the most popular of them. And so maybe people like to have a Rick von Sloniker or a Friends Valdash. One character I really want to single out here is actually Peppy, who this viewing your remark about how all the characters are honorable. I love how that plays into Peppy. In almost any other film, this character would be intolerable. He'd be the one annoying character who everyone complains about, but he's not. I do find him really annoying. <laughs> I do find the character really annoying. I mean, it's a little bit kind of annoying thing that makes everything else more beautiful. I mean, the character is used really well and all the little steps he takes and all the little things he does. But William Tracy playing Peppy is, is he's sort of trying to be annoying to the awful Mrs. Matuchak where his conflict is, but it doesn't hurt the movie. It maybe helps the movie ultimately. It really pays off. Everything really pays off. Also, Frank Morgan, this is one of his great performances. He's so touching. I mean, I guess the warmth in the movie comes from Frank Morgan and Felix Bressart. Both of them are really adding to the warmth of the story because Hugo Matichek is so humanized. He's almost nothing but flaws. I mean, he's (laughs) good hearted up to a point, but just nothing but flaws and misperceptions and pride and all these things. But I think the end, the sort of dance between Matoshek and Pepe is great. It's good to bring up Frank Morgan and Matoshek because the scene where every single time I watch the film, I get won over by Pepe is the scene where Matoshek attempts suicide. And it's one of the most sober moments of Lupita's whole career. It's this really disarming scene. Pepe, who at no point at any given moment has seemed on the level. He's always, yeah, as you say, in the universe, a little annoying. As he sees what's happening with Matoshek, all that falls away. And he is at heart this honorable person and just trying to save his mentor and boss and friend. It's completely played straight. And that moment always disarms me because even when he reverts back to being this character later, you always have this little asterisk in your head of, oh, you know, at, at heart, he'll do the right thing. It's hilarious when he becomes puffed up as the latest of the clerks and gets to hire the new delivery boy. And he says, send over a whole slew of them and I'll I'll decide. And he hires the one with no family in Budapest, which Mm -hmm. works out well for Mr. Matoshek when Mr. Matoshek is left alone on Christmas Eve. What surprised me in rewatching the film is I thought all the drama about the attempted suicide and revealing who Mrs. Matoshek's lover was, I thought all that came at the very end of the film. Mm -hmm. But it really is, is, I think, earlier than two thirds of the way through. I'm so glad you bring this up because if I have one big note about the film in bold, it's the wacky structure 
structure of it. And I mean that in the best possible sense. I shouldn't say wacky structure. It's a genius structure where all the conflicts come to a head at around the two thirds mark. You have the big long diner scene, the attempted suicide, and everything just slowly falls away in the last third of the film. It's not that conflicts come to a head and resolve themselves. It's they come to a head and then they slowly stop being relevant until we're just kind of left with this beautiful half hour denouement. I mean, it's wonderful. And it's sort of, I guess, logical that you'd misremember it. I've read the Lubitsch biographies, but not recently. So I don't really remember the story of the development of this film. Comparing the original play by Miklos Laszlo to what Samson Raffleson and supposedly Van Hack did to the script. Because, I mean, watching the film as a writer, I think, oh my gosh, this is just so amazing that every minute there's something touching and, and humorous and, and informative in an interesting way, in an original way. How did this writing process, you know, go? Lubitsch's usual writing process was fascinating because with the exception, I believe, of to be or not to be in his Hollywood films, everything was an adaptation. But how they would start was Lubitsch would basically bring the writer in and give them the elevator pitch for it, you know, 25 words or less, here's what happens, and then instruct the writer not to read it because he doesn't want the writer to be limited. Shop Around the Corner, though, seems to be slightly more involved in terms of that because there's numerous lines in the play, Parfumery, that end up in the film. Just with changes, the overall plot is very similar with a couple big structural changes. Like, for example, at the beginning of the play, Clara is already working at the store, so we don't see her get hired. But overall, it seems that the two works are much more similar than, for example, Design for Living, which none of the text came through intact. It's just the overall general shape of the story or The Merry Widow, which is almost a remix. In the case of Raffleson and with Ben Heck too, their writing style was they would talk through the film, they would literally just improv in a writer's room type thing with a stenographer on hand, writing down their improvisations and their discussions, forming a script out of that. Then they would take that and do a paper edit. And that's the film. It does sound like the Brackett and Billy Wilder process. And mm-hmm, even it does. when Wilder's with the I.L. Diamond. Yeah, very verbal. Reading this as someone who has written a few films, but it's always been solo. It opened a bit of a door. So whatever I write next, I'm going to try and have shouting matches with my writing partner. Have you had, I mean... On those scripts, have you had a writing partner? Generally, I do. Uh, Willa and I co write everything, but it's usually a correspondence type thing. I usually write a first draft like drunk when I'm in Poland or something. And like in a day, you know, a rough first draft. And then Willa will take it and make it not terrible. Where do you go in Poland? Well, in the case of, I mean, I'm thinking of one film in particular where uh, The Martyr, which is a satire I did about indie filmmakers. It was a short film, but I wrote it in four hour stretch, sitting bored in Gdansk, waiting for my in-laws to get home. I think I've written two films in Poland, which is about as many as I've written in Vancouver. It's a great place to write if you're alone and uh, you don't speak much Polish like, my, like and me. And what do you get drunk on? Vodka or Nalewka, which is this, it almost tastes like fruit juice, but it's like 40%, 50% sometimes alcohol. Wow. And let's go to Poland and talk through a script together. Oh, that would be lovely. Who will be the, who will be the stenographer? We just need the stenographer. Let's get a group of people together and write a script, talk through a script in Krakow. Here's what we'll do. We'll just pull a random old Viennese play out of a hat, and none of us will have read any of it except for just the plot summary on Wikipedia or whatever. And then we have to adapt it with the rule that we never read anything more about it. No, I don't believe in that. I think we should copy as much as possible, as much as what works. So we should have someone read through all of Miklos Laszlo's plays to see which is the best one to do next. All right. We're already disagreeing. We're already fighting about material. And that, of course, is the heart of this process. Yes. Verbal arguments. And Raffleson writes that they would have almost shouting matches and then they would just retire to the dining room and have a very polite dinner together where the only rule was you could not talk about the script. <laughs> That's very good. I think the reason why I wanted to make films and write them is because I wanted that experience. I was scared of the original aspiration. Very young was to be a novelist, which I sort of gave up on during university and afterwards. And so I wanted this sort of social experience of working in, in film or TV where you'd be with other people doing things. And that really appealed to me, not being alone. I tried to start the Metropolitan Script with a chatty friend, and that lasted two hours. And ever <laughs> since then, I've done it alone. And, you know, it hasn't been great. I mean, I'm happy with the five films and one pilot done, but it's much too little. Mm. And I guess that's partly not being a good businessman about selling things and getting things set up. I think it's also partly not being productive screenwriter. 
I don't know. Now that I've done it this way so many times, I'm not sure if I could do the um, the talk through the script thing with someone else or who that person would be. One thing I do find is that the really good ideas come when I'm not writing, like when I'm not sitting down trying to pound something out. It's always when you're walking somewhere, or going down the stairs or coming back from swimming on a holiday. It's like when your mind is working, but you're not in front of a typewriter or a computer. I think that some writers have described well the process. The late Anthony Minghella said that it's like you've got to be sort of there to, to receive the material, but it's as if a drawer opens and you can take something out and then the drawer's going to close again. So I've been condemned to be a solo writer, and I guess, I guess that's what I want to be. In this specific process, other than the fact that it takes longer, do you think that that compared to, for example, the you know the Lubitsch method of you knock out something much faster? Lubitsch directed three films in 1932, all of which he essentially guide the writing to. It wasn't like he was accepting a script from out of nowhere. Do you think that that has an impact on the final shape of the film in a way that stands out to you? Yeah, we can admire these films that were done in that period, but I'm not sure if we can really recreate the conditions. Mm. And so we can try to do something good, but it'll be different. I mean, it'd be wonderful to be in that situation, I think, to have the prestige and success of Lubitsch working within the studio system where he was given a certain amount of respect and discretion. You wouldn't want to be subject to the studio system as it is now if it somehow reconstituted itself and we were all studio slaves. He was one of the few who managed to be his own free agent, right? I mean, at this point, it was his only film for a while where he had to take a subpar studio deal to get it made. He, he actually made Ninochka as a contractual obligation to make this. Wow. What great films to do out of contractual need. There's a book about the studio system that I really like. It's called The Genius of the System. I think it's by Thomas Schatz. One of the things I found really interesting about it was that the book is very good, but the title's a misnomer because if you really look at it, it's the genius of people within a system that was still inexperienced, that was still new. It was a new system. It was somewhat established. It was not in its decadence. It was in its prime and in its growth. But what really marked it was the genius of individuals, not the system. So again and again, you see certain individuals who were creating the great things. The genius of RKO in the early 30s, you have David O. Selznick as the first studio boss, and then Marion C. Cooper as the second studio boss, and each one of them adding elements to the genius of that group of people. Marion Cooper putting together Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, that whole team that made Gate of Orsay and Top Hat, Mark Sandwich's director. It's just remarkable to see how the same people keep showing up doing the great work. And among the directors, you know, John Ford, but John Ford was teaming with Marion Cooper to make Wagon Master. And what makes the great, great classic directors especially admirable is that they were able to keep the quality of the studio era going into the 40s and 50s and even 60s. So it's really a story of individuals. Something you remarked before we recorded that I think could be interesting to bring up here is your sentiment that you wish Lubitsch had been born later. A lot of Lubitsch's work was in the earlier era, but I think he's especially a genius when we have sound, when there is music and words. I think it's through the great period. And he already was in declining health in a lot of that period. His energy and his security was was flagging a bit. If he'd been born eight or 10 years later and the the wonderful narrative sound era had caught him in his absolute full-on prime, we would have had more of the best Lubitsches. But I have to say that um, I did have an experience in Paris that you have in Paris where we were looking for a film to go with a family including two 14-year-old girls to see a movie on a Sunday night where they have these wonderful repertory theaters and a lot of them in the same neighborhood. I say, oh my gosh, there's a Lubitsch I haven't heard of playing at the cinema, Lady Windermere's fan. I don't know why I haven't heard of it. Yes. So we walk in and then we see that, oh my gosh, it's a silent film. And I think, oh my gosh, these 14-year-old girls aren't going to want to watch it. So we stayed and it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. a great movie. And that you could adapt an Oscar Wilde play. I mean, the most verbal, dialogue-dependent 
thing and, and do it beautifully and wonderfully. That's Lubitsch. As a public, we kind of got a raw deal that his crime did not overlap perfectly with those first great 20 years of cinema. My big what if is what if his heart wasn't bad and he lived to be 80, you know, lived to be 90 and made films. I don't know. I think it was already fading a little bit. Maybe it was the heart disease. For me, Sharp Around the Corner is the last great Lubitsch film. Two thoughts on this. One is that I also think that part of what makes his sound film so vital is that he was so steeped in the silent cinema that his sense of rhythm was incredible. The silent films call for a certain type of rhythmic editing that's very distinct from sound films. I feel like he learned those lessons and even in a relatively restrained film like Shop Around the Corner, every cut is so well placed and he supervised all his editors. He was one of the few Hollywood directors to actually be in the editing room from the start to finish. And my second thought is just that To Be or Not To Be, I think it's on most days my favorite Lubitsch film. It's very different in how it operates in virtually any other Lubitsch film, but that I think is one of the perfect satires. I believe it was after Heaven Can Wait, he had his big heart attack and that really sidelined him. And he only really finished one film after that, which is Clooney Brown, which you can really tell. If you know his health at that point, it's a movie that's palpably made by someone who's not well. I think that the decline in the studio system began in 1941 and was really severe. So some people say, oh, they were starved of funds because they lost all the enemy countries in Germany and the Axis powers. And other people say, no, the problem was during the war, people were so desperate for entertainment, they could make anything and people would go to see it. Mm. So standards declined. I think the studios got into formulas and shortcuts and it was no longer new, the sort of tyranny of niche raising its ugly head. Maybe he would have been one of the greats like Hitchcock and Ford who would keep his teams together and energetically keep making great films. The thing about Lubitsch is that he is so defined by his ability to adapt, you know, without tilting at the mores of whatever time he was in, right? In Weimar, Germany, he's making the films that are economically advantageous for him to make, right? Especially those large historical epics. And I don't think those are very good. The comedies are much better. And then in the silent era, he doesn't ride ways of trends, but he has a good eye for what the public needs. And for example, you know, in the pre-code era, he's making these filthy films. <laughs> he's making these films where, you know, in Design for Living, you have a rejection of most of society, at least most of the social structures. His films deal with especially sex, very frankly, in that era, in a way that he still maintains his usual highly acculturated feeling. And yet once the Hayes Code era comes, he actually quits directing for three years, essentially, because he's the production head of Paramount. When he returns, though, he's a different filmmaker and his films are in some ways out of step with the times. And that, that was the screwball era of the late 30s. He had Angel and Bluebeard's Eighth Wife that were not bombs, but they weren't that successful. And then, of course, he roars back with Nanochka and Chop Around the Corner. He never sacrifices that gentleness. He doesn't try and be Preston Sturges or Frank Capra. It's also worth knowing that Shop Around the Corner was a huge hit. It was a surprise. It was made on a very small budget by his standards. It was less than half a million dollars. And yet it made $1.3 million. And it was a bigger hit than the Nachka, which is the one the studios pushed him to do. Did you see the little article I wrote about it? Well, there's a book coming out actually on, on our films in which it reprints that article and other articles that I've written about Preston Sturges and people. That book is coming out. It's already been printed, but it's officially being released in September. It's Editor's note, Witt's book, entitled Not So Long Ago, is, by virtue of the many months that elapsed between the recording and release of this episode, now available. Thank you so much, Witt, for joining us. This has been absolutely lovely, and uh, I can't wait to uh, share this episode when we release it, whenever that happens. Thanks very much for the chance to talk about Lubitsch. Psychologically, I'm very confused. But personally, I don't feel bad at all. Hey, everyone. We're here with Jose Arroyo. You might all remember Jose from our episode on Carmen. And Jose, you're one of quite a few people who have come to me with a desire to talk about Shop Around the Corner. But you have a very specific topic that you want to talk about. That is the ending of Shop Around the Corner. Well, thank you very much. I really wanted to be a part of this one because I think the ending of this film, well, it's one of the greatest films of all time. It's a magical film and it has a magical ending particularly the very last moment in the film, is one that rebalances everything that you've seen before. You might uh, remember Prolic, played by James Stewart, tells Clara, played by Margaret Sullivan, he knows she's going to get engaged <laughs> that evening. It's Christmas Eve. 
They've had major sales. The whole shop has revived. Everything is swimmingly. And this is going to be the cherry on the cake that they will both get engaged. But then, of course, she says, well, how do you know I'll get engaged? Right. Like she follows him. But let me backtrack a little bit. The ending is that moment where Clara asks Kralik to show her his legs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To make sure that he's not bow legged. And I think that's the moment that actually rebalances everything. It's a very democratic moment. It's also a moment that underlines Clara's agency. It really bears a comparison to You've Got Mail, where Meg Ryan tells Tom Hanks, oh, I was hoping it would be you. And then you have the park and flowers and a dog bouncing up and down and over the rainbow comes out in the soundtrack. And then the camera lifts to the sky. And it's a lovely ending. It's quite emotional. But compare it to the shop around the corner. Compare it to that moment where Clara asks him, show me your legs. What's preceded that is a series of disappointments. So she follows Kralik and says, how do you know I'm going to get engaged? And he tells her, oh, because I talked to him. I have to tell him he's your boyfriend. There's a series of disappointments that are all beautifully choreographed by very similar camera movements, and also by a shutting of the lights at each shot. So it's basically like, I think, three or four quite long takes, right, that begin with movement that kind of often frames them as a couple in a medium long shot. And then the couple is broken up either through a cutting or to the camera following James Stewart. So what you have is this formation and deformation of a couple and this repetition of the camera movement, and then the turning off of lights that follows each crushing disappointment. The first disappointment is that his name is Popkin, <laughs> right? River Popkin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a joke, right? The sound alone makes you laugh, but it's a disappointment to her. And then you feel that Krolik is being very, very mean because he knows it's her, but she doesn't know it's him. So there's a deferential of knowledge. And actually, the whole thing could be like quite sexist and brutish. I mean, here is a man, here is this hopeful shop girl who's dying to be engaged to the man she's fallen in love with through letters. And he is very deliberately crushing her. Yeah, everything is a disappointment. First, his name is Popkin. Then it's, oh, I hope you don't put him on a diet. Why is he fat? <laughs> yeah, so his name is Popkin. He's fat. He's unemployed. He's hoping to live off her income. And then the worst thing of all is he hasn't even written the letters that she fell in love with, mm -hmm. right? To love is to be two and yet one. A man, a man and, and a, a woman blended as angel. Heaven itself. That's Victor Hugo. He stole that. So I think those are three or four really beautifully choreographed shots with these patterns of repetition, each of them a blow to Clara. Yeah, from Kralik. And it culminates in this moment where she goes to sit down and the camera pulls away, right? Which is almost like this embodiment of the sigh, of this disappointment, of the crushedness, right? It's really done by the, by the camera moving away as she's sitting down. It's almost like she can't bear it any longer. She can't stand up. She's got to sit down, right? It's that choreography of her movement towards the seat as the camera pulls away, as it dollies back, that creates, I don't know, it's like a, a sigh, a, this great feeling of like all her world falling apart, all her hopes and expectations. It's in that choreographed moment, right? It's so beautiful. And then along with these lights being turned off on Clara, <laughs> you get this sense of not just a kind of a darkness, but also a kind of an intimacy, a hushedness, a kind of a move into an interior space. So unlike You've Got Mail, there's no music here. The music in the film comes out only at the very last moment. Mm -hmm. And there's this beautiful reframing that the camera does, yeah, where you get the couple and then it dissolves. And then, of course, at the moment of greatest intimacy, which is when they both sit in that sofa at the end, the camera moves into a very tight close up of both of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And you get a sense of interiority of feeling. The whole thing is imbued by feeling. And it's very important, right, because the way that endings work, the ending always has to reply to the beginning. 
right? And what do we see at the very beginning of the film? Unlike You've Got Mail, this is a film that brings up all the complexities of life. It's about work. Yeah. Remember how few films are actually about work and the necessity of work and rivalries at work and, you know, the various relationships that people have to work and to the boss. So as the film begins, you have someone who's kind of clearly come from an ascetic nation and who's been given a gift. You know, it's almost he's clearly a gigolo. Why is he a gigolo? Well, he needs money. And then you have Margaret Sullivan desperate to get a job. Right. She's supporting her mother and her aunt, and she's almost fainting with the need to get a job because if they don't get a job, they can't eat. And then you have the whole jokes with Pirovich, kind of, I'm not going to give him my real opinion. I'm no fool. And again, it's one of those beautiful jokes that the film replays over and over and over again. Right. Pirovich attempt to escape being asked for his honest opinion. Right. <laughs> yeah. But again, that comes from he's got a child to support. Right. He's got a child that he carries in his wallet. The picture. He's got a family. He can't afford to lose his job. He can't afford to give his honest opinion. So, in this context of work, where you have other things like Frank Morgan as the owner, he's in love with his wife, but she's decided she doesn't want to grow old with him. The solution of a partnership of a certainty in his life that drives him to attempt to commit suicide, right? So, it's a Christmas movie about work full of darkness that ends in this kind of a romance, but it's a kind of a romance that's aware of the complexities of life, of work, of relationships, of money, of the importance of, you know, looks. <laughs> yeah, kind of, you know, this is not one of those films that's just concerned about the beauty of the inner mind and the ideas and the writings expressed in the letters. That is the most crushing thing. When she sits down, it seems like all the breath has been taken away from her in that fantastic camera move. It's because she's told that he hasn't written his own letters. You know, that beautiful line where he says, oh, he didn't write that. It's Victor Hugo. It really seems to take all the breath out of her. So this person is not who she thought he was at all. And so the mind is the most important thing to her. You know, that sensitivity and that ability to express one's inner thoughts. But it's also important to her that he have a job. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, that, that he be presentable, that he not be bow-legged. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that line, do you mind, she says, if I ask you to show me your legs. And then there's a cut. And do you see James Stewart's legs? And his legs are perfectly fine. And then there's a cut. The music comes on. And she just embraces him, right? Throws herself at him in that wonderful close-up. And that's the end of the film. But that... I, I hope you don't mind, but can you show me your legs? It's kind of an insistence on her equality, her agency. She gets to make the final choice about whether they're a couple or not, mm -hmm. right? And that's absolutely important because, again, if you compare it to You've Got Mail, where Meg Ryan is all teary and so happy and almost grateful that it's him and they're about to be a Yeah, this... She's his equal. Why is she his equal? Because she's, she's the one who gets to say yes or no. And it's all in one line, in one shot. She may be desperate. She may be worried about her mother, but she's not going to say yes to just any guy, even if it's clear at that moment that he is the one who's written all the letters, right? If he's both legged, she might not want him. Right? Like a, yeah. So that one simple shot, to me, brings a whole female agency a whole democratizing aspect, an equality to the film, because you can forgive Jimmy Stewart being so mean to her because he is mean, right? That whole series of the last shots after they come out of the locker room, he knows what he's doing. He knows how she'll respond to his being called popkin, being fat, being unemployed, and not even having written the levers. She's basically kind of putting her down at each instance. He's got a right to because she was so mean to him, right? That scene where they were meeting with the Tolstoy book, she's shooing him away and she tells him, you insignificant little clerk. <laughs> I have to laugh when I think of you calling me an old maid. You, you little insignificant clerk. You can't get a more crushing line <laughs> than that, really. You can see maybe why James Stewart maybe has a right to be mean, but mean he is. <laughs> yes. It feels very relatable, too, in the sense that he's created this idealized man for her to fall in love with, the man of the letters. And he feels that the only way he can properly introduce himself 
is to tear down this idealized man back down to his level so he can compare to him. But regardless of how mean it is, it feels completely in keeping with the character we know. Well, because Krolik is smart and he's intelligent and he is destroying Popkin, who really is him, by making her think of the alternatives, right? Because would you prefer to be with someone who's overweight or with someone like me? You know, would you prefer to be with someone who you have to live off your salary or would you prefer you have to live off my salary? So, you know, the comparison is being set up and it's kind of very interestingly set up because, of course, Popkin is an imaginary mm -hmm. figure. The dear reader is not. The dear reader really is frolic. But by putting up the comparison, he's kind of trying to make her see what a relative good catch he <laughs> is, right? So there is also that going on in the way that the ending is written, which again is why it becomes so significant. That brief moment, which is its own joke of, yes, show me your legs, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of those minor moments, but then nonetheless, the film would be a very different film without that, mm -hmm. right? It is that thing that makes her a final say, makes her an agent in her own destiny. She's not going to be fooled into hitching her wagon to someone who might not be what she wants. She wants proof. And that alters the whole dynamics of the film, even as it answers the beginning. You have all these employees at the beginning, all kind of needing work. There's a romance that blossoms, but it's also a real romance. It's a romance that's physical and social and emotional, right? Because Clara has a wonderful line. Oh, yes, I've got lots of experience. I worked for ex-brothers and sons. And, you know, the brothers were fine, but the sons, right? <laughs> yeah. And actually in that line, you get a whole sense of what it must be to be a single woman whose whole family depends on her wages and the sexual harassment that goes on at work. And you get that whole sense of what women must have gone through in situations like that, which, again, makes her agency at the end all the more remarkable. I really love that it frames their happily ever after ending as not this storybook romance. Oftentimes with especially romantic comedies, I mean, with You've Got Mail, there's this implication that they're going to live out the rest of their lives. You're going to be happy. You know, it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. In this film, I get the sense that their relationship is going to be a new, interesting journey that to take the words of Minercheck, maybe they don't want to grow old together, right? Maybe they're in love right now. This could fall apart. There could be strife, but they're going to give it a go and try and be the best versions of themselves, the versions of themselves they put forward in those letters. I kind of agree, except I do think that they're fated for each other, <laughs> that they'll be perfect to other, that, you know, they'll bicker away for the rest of their lives. That's a good way to put it. They'll bicker away. It feels like instead of a, an idealized relationship ensues, a real relationship ensues, as you said, you know, one that has its ups and downs. It has its ups and downs. They'll argue throughout, but they'll make each other better for being with each other, right? Like you, you get a real sense of that from the film. But the way that the film in this very hushed, almost spiritual, romantic way brings in all the different realities of life, the wages, the looks, the rivalries, the vengefulness, you get all of that within this almost kind of spiritual hushedness that is the end of the film, in this very patterned and beautiful way where visually the couple comes together, falls apart. It's, it's kind of a marvelous ending. I think the choreography of the camera around the relationships of the couple and those moments of coming into light and then the lights turning off throughout those sequences of shots is just beautiful and all really culminating in that choreography of the movement into the settee with the camera pulling away the deflation of that, and then coupled with the show me your legs. She's only been completely crushed a minute ago. Yeah, <laughs> but at the end, she gets to make that decision. It's so beautiful. I can't think of a, of a better, more sophisticated, more layered ending that brings up all of these social complications in a film that is only meant to be a romantic comedy. Yeah, but it's about so much more than that. Well, I can't think of a better way to close off this discussion than that. That's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Jose. The ending of the film is really 
one of my favorite sustained half hour acts in cinema. If Mr. Moderchuk kind of casing everyone because he's lonely and wants to have oh. a partner for dinner, it wasn't enough. That dance they do that you've described is if anyone listening still has somehow not seen Shop Around the Corner, which is probably unlikely because it's one of the two most popular Lubitsch films, according to Letterboxd. Watch the film, watch that ending and listen to Jose describe it because it's one of the most, my most cherished moments in all cinema. Yeah, mine too. Thank you very much, then. Next week, Adrian Martin joins us for our final episode on The Shop Around the Corner. Head over to ErnstCast.com for information as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes and our Discord server. How Would Lubitsch Do It is a production of Moving Image Agency. Willa Ross was our dialogue editor for this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you happen to use. It helps other people find our podcast and therefore find Ernst Lubitsch. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples.